Ah, I think you can stand right. anywhere you okay. understand. Yes. Um, and I'm going to introduce you. So it's my pleasure to welcome you to this talk organized by the Slavic Center. I really want to say Eileen for all her work on this and how she encouraged me early on in the process to invite Max Burkhardt to talk to us about his recent book. And I'm going to just do a brief uh, um, introduction of Professor Burkhardt and then just uh, let him um, you know, um, deliver his uh, talk. Uh, professor Burkhardt is an Associate Professor of History at Concordia University in Montreal, Canada, where he has taught since 2011. He received his PhD in Balkan and Eastern European History at the University of Toronto in 2010. And his interests include microhistorical approaches to the history of modern Europe, with a particular focus on the local dynamics of nationalism, intercommunal violence, and historical memory. His fieldwork focuses on Bosnia and Herzegovina, Croatia, and Serbia, where he researches in central and provincial archives and conducts oral history interviews in small towns and villages. And we're going to probably have a chance to talk about his methodologies uh, uh, as well. Uh, he is the author of a wonderful monograph that some of the students in my graduate seminar on Eastern European history read earlier this semester. Violence is a generative force, identity, nationalism, and memory in a Balkan community, published by the best press out there, Cardinal <laughs> University Press, 2016, with a great uh, reading list in Eastern European history. Uh, and um, we are going to get, uh, you know, some feel some sense of what this book is all about uh, in this talk, so I'm not going to go into any detail talking about its multiple contributions. Uh, but uh, it is remarkable how many prizes this book has won since its uh, publication, including very recently the 2018 European Studies Book Award by the Council for European Studies at Columbia University, but uh, probably the most enviable uh, award on the list here uh, is the 2007 uh, 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 Herbert Baxter Adams Prize awarded by the American Historical uh, Association. Um, and uh, Professor Burkos has published extensively in various uh, outlets of peer reviewed journals and also uh, twice in the American Historical Review, which is no small, small a bit for a historian of, well, let's say, my generation. Mm -hmm. uh, so, <laughs> uh, so um, I think uh, that I am just going to leave it here. Actually, one more piece of information a Bosnian version. Uh, of uh, his book, a Bosnian edition of his book, uh, is under preparation right now and it will be published in 2018 by Buy Books in Sarajevo. Uh, and then, uh, even more remarkably to me, when I read this uh, on your uh, website, a Chinese edition of the book is currently under preparation. Who would think? Uh, yes, <laughs> and it will be published in 2019 by Imaginist in Beijing. So, uh, please join me in welcoming Professor Berko. Thanks very much, um, Professor Dragostinova, for that very warm uh, and generous introduction. And thank you to all of you for coming today. Uh, I appreciate it. Um, I want to just also thank the Center for Slavic and East European Studies here at OSU for supporting this event, as well as the History Department's Russian, East European, and Eurasian History Seminar, who I believe also um, was important in making this event happen today. I also want to say it's nice to be back here. I was last time I was at Ohio State was in 2011 for a wonderful conference uh, that Professor Agustino Bell organized with some of our colleagues here, um, and a, a great edited volume has come out recently based on the papers of that conference. Uh, that conference was a place in which I started to test out some of the ideas that crystallized in this book, uh, and it was a very important experience for me. So it's nice to be back uh, and revisit. So in the next 45 minutes or so, I want to discuss this book that I published recently. And I'm going to do so in three ways. I want to begin by discussing how I discovered the book's subject. And I'm going to say a little bit about the research process. Second, I want to briefly tell part of the book's main story. It's a large book. There are many aspects to it. I can't tell everything, but I've chosen one part to discuss, narrate, and to some extent analyze. And finally, I want to finish with some brief reflections about the book's contributions. Not just the scholarly contributions, the contributions that I think would be useful to other researchers, but also what I see as the main contributions to the part of the world 
whose history I try and tell, that is Bosnia and Herzegovina, Croatia, and to some extent Serbia. So what would a book like this mean? What do I hope it to mean for readers in this part of the world, since it's going to be published very soon? So the moment my journey to write this book actually began, um, I can remember it very clearly. It was on a September afternoon in 2006. Uh, on that afternoon, I was in the archive of, the, of Bosnia and Herzegovina, in Sarajevo, and I was conducting research at the time for my doctoral dissertation, which was on local struggles over how to remember the violence of the Second World War in Yugoslavia, particularly at the local level. And so I was in Bosnia, having spent the previous two years in Serbia and Croatia, searching for a third case study to go along with those that I had previously researched. So in a sense, I was, it was kind of like my last stop. I was there trying to find my last case study, finish up, write my dissertation, and begin the rest of my life. <laughs> On this afternoon, I was unexpectedly given access to one of the basements, to one of the archive's basement storage depots, which are these kind of steel door rooms that go on kind of as long as the light inside was working, which was not very much. They're kind of a bunch of flickering light bulbs um, with hundreds of thousands of documents in each. On this afternoon, the archivist, one archivist in particular, decided to let me down to the basement and into this room for about 15 minutes, um, which was a strange window of time, seeing that I had spent previous years doing research in, this, in similar types of archives. Um, in this archive, I've been searching for a number of documents related to the communist war veterans organization, those who fought during the Second World War in what used to be Yugoslavia. I knew these documents had been cataloged, they were housed in Sarajevo. But a number of the archivists, due to the war in the 1990s, had left the country. Some had been killed, some had retired. So there was a new staff there, and they really didn't know what they had, to some extent. And so the first few days I went to the archive, I requested these documents, and they simply said, they're not here. Sorry. Sorry you came all the way from Canada. Uh, and so what I decided to do was just kind of return every day with politeness, sometimes with chocolates, uh, sometimes always with a smile but always in a slightly irritating way, ask, are those documents that have been found yet? And finally, one of the archivists simply said, let that guy downstairs, I can't stand seeing him anymore. <laughs> uh, so it was an important moment where I learned um, it's very important to be polite, yet kind of annoying, uh, when you need to accomplish a task, at least in this part of the world. So one of the archivists took me downstairs, opened this door, handed me a flashlight, and said, I think what you're looking for is down there, pointing me down one of the, the shelves. Um, and as I was standing in the doorway looking into a half-lit room, she walked away and simply yelled out to me, you have 15 minutes. I said, why only 15 minutes? She said, because my, myself and my colleagues were going to coffee in 15 minutes. It's all the time we get. So my research window was structured around a coffee break. So I began walking down the aisle she pointed me toward with the flashlight, trying to read the words that were written on the phones. And the handwritten words on a handful of blue folders stopped me in my tracks. And they looked very much like these folders. <coughs> these are folders from the same archive. But the words on these folders that I saw in the aisle were different. They read, Sites of Mass Executions, 1941 to 1945. This is not the kind of label you usually see on documents. And what I had stumbled across was in fact a confidential communist government ordered investigation that had been compiled during the first half of the 1980s. So these were actually relatively new documents. According to the law in Bosnia and Herzegovina on the use of archival documents, however, no researcher is supposed to see, let alone touch, a document until 30 years have elapsed from the time it was created until the time a researcher would like to see it. So this was 2006. These documents had been written between 1983 and 1986. I wasn't supposed to see them or touch them. I picked them up. <laughs> put them against my chest. I called out to the coffee break lady, and I said, I'm done, let's go upstairs, back to the reading room. And the papers inside, as I read over the next hour, repeatedly mentioned a town and its surrounding community that I, in fact, had never heard of. The town was called, or is called, Kulinvakuf, and the villages that surround it, all of which straddle the historic border between northwest Bosnia and Croatia. So here's a map of the region from the 1920s. Don't get excited that you don't see Kosovo or Macedonia. 
I'm not a Serb nationalist. Uh, this is simply a map from the 1920s, and those regions were not generally drawn. Uh, so this is the region that I'm talking about. And Kulin Vakov is lo located directly on the Una River. Here's a picture of the town of Kulin Vakov, which I took during 2008 when I was doing field work in the region for the first time. At the heart of this region, and not simply at the town of Kulin Vakov, is the Una River, which flows directly through the town. Due to a specific content of sediment in the water, and the fact that the water is extremely pure, the Una often appears emerald green when the sun beams down. And it generally flows along very softly. So, if you were to walk from the center of Kulin Vakov, where the mosque is, down the main street, and walk across the bridge and stand somewhere in the middle, all you would hear would be this nice, relaxing, gug, bur uh, bubbling and gurgling sound. If you close your eyes, it's one of the most peaceful sounds you can imagine. Just water slowly percolating over rocks, around grass that's growing through the water. Here and there, the Una bursts over spectacular waterfalls, particularly to the south. But mostly, the Una flows along very softly. And it's visually mesmerizing due to these magnificent colors. The documents in those blue folders told that during two days and nights in early September 1941, this stunning natural world had transformed into a site of mass death. The documents indicated that approximately 2,000 people, men, women, and children, described as of the Muslim population, were killed by their neighbors, who were described in the documents as insurgents, or in Serb Croatian, Ustanitsi, and Serbs. The documents offered a brief glimpse, only a very brief glimpse, of this multi-ethnic community's sudden descent into intercommunal killing. But while I was in the archive, I almost immediately had a very strong feeling, almost a physical sensation that I had stumbled upon a story of potentially great significance. So this is this intuition that researchers have uh, when you come across new data, where literally the hair stands up, well, not so much for me, but uh, you have a, a kind of a jolt of electricity that comes through your body, that you've come across something that has been previously unknown, and that there's, through a few sentences, there may be an entire world whose history is waiting to be written. That's the feeling I had. And 10 years later, those blue folders became this. This is the cover of the book that I published in 2016. And the major reorientation that began that day in the archive, in the basement of the archive, ultimately dragged me away from the original reason I had come to Sarajevo, which was that original interest in exploring the dynamics of local remembrance of violence, and pushed me toward the challenge of explaining the causes, dynamics, and effects of violence. And slowly my interest came to focus on a 48-hour period during which these 2,000 men, women, and children disappeared. I learned that some had been shot to death. Others were cut to pieces with farm tools. Some were drowned in that beautiful water of the Una River. Others were thrown into the darkness of deep vertical caves. I soon became fixated on explaining those terrifying 48 hours when all of this killing took place. But doing so pushed me further, pushed and pulled me further and further into the past. I soon learned that those 48 hours could not be explained without first reconstructing the destruction of the Kingdom of Yugoslavia in April of 1941, and then the subsequent creation of the fascist independent state of Croatia and its policies of ethnic discrimination and violence during the spring and summer of that year. Explaining those transformations pushed me back to the political struggles of the first Yugoslavia during the 1930s and then to the 1920s, and excavating the dynamics of social conflict and cohesion during the interwar years led me back to the period of Austro-Hungarian rule from 1878 to 1918, and then to the preceding centuries of Ottoman rule, during which the town of Kulin Vakov was established at the end of the 17th century on an island in the middle of the Una River. So I kept turning back in time in pursuit of evidence. And once I felt like I had excavated nearly every piece of evidence that I thought existed on this community, 
I then switched directions. I began to write the story of Kulin Bakov forward in time, toward the summer of 1941, and finally to where I began in the basement of the archive, to those 48 hours in early September of that year. Doing so, however, presented me with a huge challenge. And that is, how to tell the history of this community in which shocking levels of intercommunal violence would soon take place, but without doing so in a deterministic way, as if local residents seemed destined to destroy one another because of nominal cultural differences and something called nationalism. The difficulty of telling this history with a sense of historical contingency rather than determinism can be better appreciated if we look at the scholarly literature about mass violence in this part of Europe during the year 1941. So until quite recently, historians have devoted very little sustained attention to explaining the intercommunal violence that took place in the fascist independent state of Croatia, which is usually known by its acronym, the NDH, which stands for Nezavisna Država Hrvatska, or Independent State of Croatia, the NDH. This was the new state that the Kulin Vakuf region was incorporated into in April of 1941. Here's a map of that state and where the Kulin Vakuf region was located. So among the works in the South Slavic languages, a striking characteristic is how description of violence overwhelmingly substitutes for explanation of violence. Many authors decontextualize killings by stringing together acts of violence against a particular so-called ethnic group from different locations and times, but without accounting for their temporal and geographical variation. And this approach makes it easier to argue for the importance of a supposedly deeply rooted nationalist ideology as the primary cause of violence. Among historians outside of the Balkans, there have been a number of illuminating studies published during the last decade or so on the history of the NDH, and I'm thinking here of works by my colleagues Emily Grebel and Tomislav Dulic, and there are others. And yet, when it comes to explaining the causes, dynamics, and effects of violence, this literature offers surprisingly few answers. And part of, the, part of the problem here is that while this newer work has much to say about life in the few urban centers in the NDH, literally two cities, Zagreb and Banja Luka, and the actions of political elites, it is striking how little we still know about the countryside of the NDH, places like Kulinvakov. Despite a consensus among scholars, vast majority of intercommunal violence from 1941 to 1945 <coughs> actually took place in the countryside. And this hole in the literature is perplexing, given the shift in research on violence during the past decade in other contexts around the world, such as South Asia, Africa, as well as other parts of Eastern Europe, in which the local level, particularly the rural regions, have become a central subject for analysis. Regarding the NDH, part of the problem has to do with the research questions that have retained importance. Historians tend to focus on subjects that have long dominated this field, such as how many people were killed in the NDH? Do certain killings constitute genocide? The wartime experience of certain ethnic groups, and there are other questions. All of these questions have their place, but their continued prominence helps to maintain a certain inward, even provincial focus in this field. And as a consequence, there has been a lack of engagement with broader scholarly debates, particularly debates in the social science literature on political violence, currently taking place about the dynamics of violence in various contexts throughout the world. So to surmount these challenges in the literature, I chose to employ a dual approach in the research and writing of this book. So on the one hand, I wanted to make the rural community, a rural community, like the Kulin Vakov region, the central lens of analysis from start to finish. On the other hand, I wanted to build an analytical bridge between the specific history of this community 
and debates about the dynamics of violence in various contexts throughout the world. So my challenge was to write a rich micro-history that could engage a number of debates in the field of political violence, but would also avoid, hopefully at least, getting bogged down in the provincial infighting and historical determinism that is common to many scholars who write about violence in this part of the Balkans. And the best way forward, it seemed to me, was to use the snapshot that I discovered in those blue folders of the killings in Poland Bakov as a window, as a micro lens, through which to embark on a search for answers to questions of global significance. And the two main questions that frame this book are, what causes intercommunal <coughs> violence among neighbors in multi-ethnic communities? And then how does such violence affect their identities and relations? So, violence as a generative force represents the culmination of my search for answers to these two main questions. This book is built on three types of sources. Documents from 12 archives in Bosnia and Herzegovina, Serbia, and Croatia. Published as well as unpublished memoirs by people who lived through this history, participants in this story. <coughs> and oral history interviews with the participants and their children, which I conducted over a period of years. The archives provided extremely valuable material for the writing of this book, including real-time sources from the summer of 1941, but they also vividly revealed the challenges of conducting research on mass violence in this post-war and politically, still politically divided part of Europe. So, in the archive of Bosnia and Herzegovina, for example, where I discovered those blue folders, I often struggled to gain access to basic information, such as what's actually in the archive. Because I wasn't dealing with one director of the archive, I was dealing with three. The existence of which reflects the conditions in today's Bosnia, in which all national level institutions have to have representatives from the three officially recognized constituent peoples. So, sometimes I would call the archive and ask, can I please speak with the director? And the person at their end would laugh and say, which director do you want, the Serb, the Croat, or the Muslim? Moreover, I discovered that all of these directors were locked in rather bitter interpersonal feuds with each other, which also made it difficult to obtain information. Then there was also a director of an important archive in the, <coughs> northwest, in the northwestern part of Bosnia, in a town called Bihać, not far from the Kulinbakov region, who told me one day in his office, that it was his personal mission to make sure I never completed my research, and then called me a bunch of names, most of which were related to sexual attacks on farm animals. His way of cursing. He finally let me into what he called his storage depot one day, uh, which was located on a military base, and walked me into a room where he said, some kind of similar words to the basement, I think what you're looking for might be in here, somewhere in this pile. Then he turned to me and said, I'm going to lunch. I'll be back in two hours. And left me alone in here to try and find uh, these documents. And I would have needed, I don't know, five or six people to help me move and spread this thing apart. Uh, and I sort of slowly circled around it uh, two or three times, not really aware of how I should start. But fortunately, due to uh, a number of years of research in Serbia and Croatia, I had a sense of how certain documents were marked. Uh, and the type of organizations I was looking for had very specific insignia and acronyms. And I furiously moved one part of the stack this way. And somewhere right in about here, I discovered about 80 of the 160 or so boxes that I was actually looking for. Moved them off to the side and told him, there's great news. I found something to look at. And then he made up a number of excuses why that would never happen. Such as he had just bought a new car and would never allow such dirty documents in his car. There was no place in the town for me to read the documents and so on and so forth. Eventually, after about a month or so of struggle with this individual, I finally managed to get uh, permission to look at these documents. Um, some of the other sources I used to write this book were unpublished manuscripts, which had been written during the 1970s and 1980s by people who had survived the 48 hours of killing in Kulin Vakov. <clears throat> so I learned about some of these manuscripts while I was doing my oral history interviews, and people told me, the person who wrote this is dead, but his son might have it, but he was displaced in the most recent war. I think he's in this town, he's in that village. So working kind of as my own personal private investigator, I just started calling sometimes the same last name from the telephone book uh, until I managed to come across that person. Invited myself over for coffee, and after usually an hour or so of explaining what I was looking for and showing that I actually 
knew the language, and had knowledge of the region's history, people would say, that manuscript is in a shoebox in the closet if you want it. You can take photographs of it or Xerox it. And then there were people in Kulin Vakuf and its surrounding villages whom I interviewed. And this was very difficult work for different reasons. So at first, most people, when I would show up at their house or walk into their fields while they were working with animals or on vegetable gardens, they just assumed I was not who I claimed to be. So I said, I'm a historian. I'm interested in what took place in 1941. And the first thing I thought was that I was actually an investigator for the International War Crimes Tribunal for former Yugoslavia, uh, which meant I was dangerous. Or some people just said, I heard them say to relatives, this is a CIA agent. <laughs> okay. He's a foreigner, but he knows our language. He must work for the CIA. Um, but very quickly, once I would explain that I actually knew names of the village in the region, that I had been walking around, that I knew something about the history, um, that whole kind of fear seemed to dissipate. And then it seemed that people had a very strong desire to tell their stories. Many of whom told me later, no one ever asked. So they were willing, if I was willing to listen, which I was. And this part of the research was challenging, to say the least, because everything I heard during these conversations was screened through people's more recent experiences of violence, from 1992 to 1995, during the most recent war in Bosnia and Herzegovina, and from 91 to 95 in Croatia. So, there was an older woman, for example, who lived alone on a ridge near Kulinvakov, about an hour's walk away through the forest, in a partially destroyed house. Her father had been one of the sole survivors of one of the massacres during those 48 hours. He managed to avoid being thrown into a pit with about 400 of his neighbors. And he had told her story, his story to her daughter, and so she, her testimony was unbelievable and very important to listen to. But three of her four sons had been killed in this most recent war. One had died, I should say, two were killed. And so aside from the first time I met with her when I was with someone else, I could tell very quickly that every question I asked was actually hurting her. And this led me to want to stop doing that type of research. And I actually pulled back away from it for a number of weeks because I thought to myself, how important are my findings versus this woman's continued suffering which I'm poking around at because of my scholarly interests. So this was a big dilemma for me. And led me to stop this type of research for a while. There was also a husband and a wife about 15 kilometers away whom I interviewed, both of whom shared insights with me about stories told to them by their parents um, about memories of the violence of 1941. These interviews were challenging for a different reason, because I discovered quickly that the husband had actually participated in ethnic cleansing operations during the summer of 1992. So I was sitting there talking with someone who may have killed people in the village 10, 15 kilometers away. And the main challenge with all of these interviews, which I think is the main challenge for anyone who researches violence in any context <clears throat> around the world, was to somehow avoid being overly sympathetic or overly judgmental, and to rather just focus on listening and learning with my eyes on the challenge of trying to explain. And this is very difficult. When you feel solidarity with victims, um, it's difficult to then walk a day later and talk to people who may have persecuted those people. But if we actually want to explain violence, that challenge has to be met as well. So when it came to obtaining sources for this book, each type presented major challenges. And there were more than a few moments during my field work when I felt it simply would not be possible to advance the project anymore. I hit a wall. For example, when I walked into this room. Um, or actually before that, when the archive director cursed me out. Um, that was a day where I felt like the project was over or at least had, had be, become limited in some major way. What often made the difference were local people who happened to take an interest in my work for whatever reason, who decided on their own volition to intervene and somehow punch through the wall and allow me to keep walking. So when the archive director said, there's no one to drive these documents, not in my new car, someone else in the archive, a woman, volunteered two days later to do so and somehow arranged for me to sit in a local museum with a wood-burning stove and read the documents. I didn't ask this person for help, she just decided to. And there were people I met in villages, such as one woman in Kulinvakov, whose husband had been arrested in 1992, had been executed, and whose body was thrown into a pit. She became very interested in the fact that I was trying to explain violence in this region, and started taking me around to different villages and introducing me to people most of whom I never would have encountered without her. 
So that's all I want to say about how I came to this topic and the process of researching it. And I want to turn now and briefly talk about the book's story, and specifically the climax of the book, the violence during the summer of 1941. So prior to 1941, in this region there existed the entwinement of religious or ethnic difference with socioeconomic cleavages, largely because of the Ottoman authorities. So, on one side, there was a class of Muslim landlords, and on the other, there was a large group of peasant tenants who were mostly Orthodox Christians as well as some Catholic. So there were long-term agrarian-based tensions in this region. But I discovered in my research, there had, they had not produced a regular history of violence, which is what I would expect to find. So this is my first kind of counterintuitive fight. Before 1941, surprisingly, at least for me, I discovered there had only been two instances of attempted and actual violence in this region. First, there was a peasant rebellion in the region from 1875 to 1878, in which Christian peasants rose up against their Muslim landlords over increases in taxes, so there was violence that occurred on a cultural axis. And second, there was some violence that took place <coughs> along the same lines in the aftermath of the formation of what's commonly called the First Yugoslavia, or what was known as the Kingdom of Serbs, Croats, and Slovenes. This is from 1918 to the early 1920s. So the new government that formed the, this new state decreed that agrarian reform would be instituted. In other words, the land that was held by the Muslim landlords would be redistributed to those who tilled the land. And some of the Christian tenants decided, we're not going to wait a year or two or five, we're going to rise up and take the land now. And so in some cases, they rose up and attacked their Muslim landlords and burned down their houses. But I also discovered evidence of inter-ethnic solidarity and cooperation during these instances of violence. So to give you one example, in 1918, a group of Orthodox peasants marched toward Kulinbaum with the intention of slaughtering the Muslim landlords who were living in the town. And they were met by an individual who came up to them and said, if you're here in peace, please enter the town. If you're here to kill our Muslim brothers, we will stop you with all force that we have from entering this town. Now you would expect that individual to have been Muslim, but in fact he was a local Orthodox priest. And he was arguing that he would be able to mobilize other Orthodox Christians to stop them. And that's because in this region, a number of landlords had actually treated their peasant tenants quite well. And so relations were not antagonistic despite nominal cultural difference and the existence of an owning class and a working class on the other side. During the existence of the first Yugoslavia from 1918 to 1941, there was some inter-ethnic tension in the region. If you read the files from the Ministry of the Internal Affairs, the police, you find evidence of some inter-ethnic conflicts. But perhaps just as common, literally if we did a statistical breakdown, just as common if not more, were examples of intra-ethnic political conflicts. That is to say, serious conflict among people of the same nominal ethnicity. So among Muslims, among Orthodox Christian Serbs. Much of the tension at the village level in this region was in fact interpersonal. People frequently came into conflict with each other over the use of natural resources, the use of water, the right to cut down trees and forests, the use of meadows for grazing. Sometimes these conflicts had an inter-ethnic element, because villages were often segmented along the lines of ethnicity, but certainly not always. So you have examples of murders taking place, of rapes, among people in the same village of the same nominal ethnicity, without evidence of people from one ethnicity and another attacking each other. So the evidence we have does not suggest that deep-seated ethnic hatred, if you want to call it that, was dominant among most people at the level of local community prior to the year 1941. For many people, everyday life was full of peaceful intermixing. There was a market every Thursday in Kulanbaku, where villagers came from every village in the region and mixed without incident. There were soccer matches at a local field, and the teams were made up of players of different nominal ethnicities, not all on one side or on the other, but the same members of the same teams. Here's a picture of one of the teams. This team was called Mladost, or Youth. And so you can tell, at least in a nominal sense, who the men would have been who would have considered themselves to be Muslim by the wearing of the fez, these individuals. But this man right here, at least nominally, 
without actually being able to ask him, how did you see yourself, Muslim, human, cool and vocal person, whatever it may have been, this individual here would have been considered to be Muslim. He's one of the ones who wrote one of those unpublished manuscripts during the 1970s. This is from uh, 1937, so just a few years before 1941. So rather than identify the enormous changes that took place between April and July of 1941 as rooted in largely antagonistic social relations, I argue in the book that we have to appreciate how outside actors could upend local ecosystems of inter-ethnic coexistence. And it was the Axis invasion of Yugoslavia in April 1941 and the establishment of the independent state of Croatia which unexpectedly presented an opportunity to those who consider themselves to be Croats. And some chose to join a group of extreme Croatian nationalists who called themselves Ustashas, which simply means insurgent in Croatia. The Ustashas were a group of fascists whom the Axis powers installed as the leaders of the independent state of Croatia, the NDH. In the Kulnivakov region, the Ustasha ideology of building an ethnically pure Croatian nation state does not appear to have been of much importance to the handful of local Muslims and Catholics who joined the Ustashas. So I've been able to count about 110 local men who joined the Ustashas. This constituted about slightly less than 1% of the total population of men who would have been nominally considered to be nominally Catholic and Muslim, so not a large percentage. Most were peasants in their 20s and 30s. There were a handful of merchants. And to give you a sense of how long-term and ethnic antagonisms do not appear to have been the key factor that led these local men to join the Ustashas, we can consider the man who became the leader of the Ustashas in Kulinovakov. His name was Miroslav Matievich. He was nominally Catholic, and he ran a tavern right next to the Una River. He moved to Kulinovakov a few years before 1941. This is Miroslav Matievich right here. This is a photograph from a wedding in a Catholic village not far from Kulinovakov in 1938. So if Matievich had been a committed Croatian nationalist, we certainly wouldn't know it from this photograph. Here, we can see him getting ready to celebrate a wedding with his neighbors, including several who would have been seen as Orthodox Serbs or Christians. For example, these two individuals here. There's a nice bottle of wine, looks like he's getting ready to drink. This is a roasted pig's head, which is a sign in this region that it's time to have a party. Uh, and here's another flask of wine. So, again, just like the photograph with the soccer team, it shows how people of different nominal backgrounds, ethnic backgrounds, were in fact interacting with each other peacefully on an everyday basis, particularly around intimate events, like sporting <coughs> events, but even more so a wedding. So, rather than being driven by a long-term commitment to nationalist politics, Matievich, along with the other local men who joined the Ustashes, appear to have been, appear to have to have joined the Ustashes for three main reasons. First, for some, to settle personal scores with neighbors over the use of natural resources. So again, the use of fields, water, uh, and forests. Some people had long simmering feuds with their neighbors over the, use of these, over the use of these resources. For others, it was an amazing situational opportunity to steal. They were empowered all of a sudden to do whatever they wanted. And in a smaller number of cases, some wanted to reverse losses that they had suffered in 1918. So some Muslim landlords lost their land. And some Catholics, some of whom had received their positions while the Austro-Hungarian authorities were in power, um, wanted to take revenge because they had been replaced by some Orthodox Christians or people who would consider themselves to be served. The central leaders of the NDH began in this region during May and June 1941 to use selective violence to try and remove from the region what could be considered to, to be called the Serb population. In the Kulinvakov region, these local Ustashas began arresting men and stealing from them. In some cases, here and there, they executed these individuals, <coughs> usually, and then usually disposed of their bodies in deep vertical caves, not far from Kulinvakov, like this one. 
They hoped that these killings would induce the rest of the perceived Serb population to flee the region, that when prominent individuals disappeared without a trace, this would cause fear, and the rest of the population would pick up and start to leave the region. Instead, the Serb population, those who were left in the villages, simply fled into the mountains, into the forests. And this caused fear among those 110 Ustashans in this region. They were afraid that there was now going to be a large-scale rebellion. And so, they decided to carry out preemptive strikes on a series of villages where the, most, where the greatest number of men had gone missing. This was on July 1st through 3rd. And it was during what I call in the book these defensive attacks that local Ustashas began killing not just prominent individuals, but everyone they could find whom they considered to be Serb, which included women, children, and the elders, to terrorize the population. And again, induce them to flee. But a significant amount of evidence, if one looks closely enough, reveals that along with this violence, there were multiple instances of inter-ethnic rescue. So, relatives of the Ustashas, for example, would hear that there was going to be an attack the next day. And late that day or early the next morning, they would walk ahead to the Serbian village and say, run to the forest now, the Ustashas will be here in two hours and you'll all be killed. So certain individuals warned uh, those who were about to be attacked. In other cases, those who survived the massacres were taken in by local Catholics and Muslims, taken to a safe area, or sometimes hidden at home, not just for weeks, but in some cases for several months. Of the approximately 100 Orthodox residents in the town of Kulinbakov in the spring of 1941, half were saved by local Catholics and Muslims. So all of this is to say that uh, many local Muslims and Catholics were far from united behind this violence of the Ustasha. <coughs> Nonetheless, by late July 1941, as far as I've been able to discern, and it's difficult to come to a very precise number, it seems that there were about six to 700 Serb victims of this violence. So the killing went on in these villages, and there were a significant number of victims. And the Ustasha violence had transformative effects. And among the most important was what sociologists and social psychologists might call the collective categorization of the other, among much of the victim population. So, for many of those defined as Serbs, and thus victims, the Ustasha violence transformed most Muslims and Catholics from neighbors, or individuals, into Ustashas, and thus enemies. And in the aftermath of these Ustasha attacks, Many defined as Serbs now wanted revenge against all those whom they perceived to be Croats. And I'll, I'll tell just one example from the book in which you can see how this more general kind of abstract process actually unfolds in, uh, in real intimate terms. So the day after one of the first attacks in early July, two survivors, two male survivors, emerged out of their hiding place in the forest at the edge of a meadow. Across the other side of the meadow, they saw one of their former neighbors a woman whose name was Stana Pavicic. She was Catholic. These two men were Orthodox. Prior to 1941, they knew each other by their first names. They were neighbors. They would greet each other by their first names, or they would call out to each other, Komšie, which means neighbor, or Komšinice, neighbor. In this particular case, the two men saw Stana Pavicic, who was alone, and they called out to her, you Croats, in the plural, not singular, but in the plural, you Croats are throwing us into pits. When our time comes, we will do the same to you. <coughs> so it shows that in the aftermath of these attacks, the singular, the individual, had been subsumed into the us and you plural, along the lines of ethnicity. And there are other instances that propelled this process forward in very terrifying ways. In one of these caves, there had been a large massacre, and two men who had been thrown in somehow survived. One had been shot through the side of his head, but somehow didn't die. Another one jumped in on his own after he saw all of his children, his sons, had been thrown in ahead of him. They somehow survived in this cave 30 meters down for like a week. When uh, several other survivors came to the edge, they yelled down and said, is anyone in there? And after a few minutes, two faint voices called out, save us. Save us, we're dying. They pulled these men out. They told what had happened to them. 
And this process propelled forward another wave of this collective categorization. They did this to us. We will now do this to them. So this process at work among these survivors, this collective categorization, I argue, was largely situational and contingent. It crystallized in certain moments in response to acts of violence, but it did not exist among a majority of people prior to these acts of violence. By the end of July, survivors hiding in the forest launched the anticipated rebellion. And this quickly set off a civil war between these insurgents they called themselves insurgents, Ustanitsi. Some people who know the historiography of this region might say, those are the Chetniks. No, Chetnitsi. These individuals did not call themselves Chetniks. They called themselves Ustanitsi, insurgents. Just like the rebels who rose up in 18, from 1875 to 1878. They did not have a clear political ideology. Their ideology was revenge and survival. This set off a war between these insurgents and the Ustashes. But there was in the region a very small number of highly politically active individuals. Those were the communists. And when I say a small number, I mean about 10, maybe 15 tops. <coughs> and they somehow wanted to take this group of embittered survivors who had seen their nearest and dearest killed in these brutal ways and transform them into what they wanted to be a multi-ethnic guerrilla army. So to collaborate not just with other survivors, other Serb survivors, but also with Muslims, also with Catholics, with anyone else who wanted to fight against the Ustashas and against the Axis powers. They sought to lead these fighters, but they had several weaknesses, the first I just mentioned. There were hardly any of them, 10 or 15. Imagine trying to control maybe 700 to 1,000 fighters, half of us in this room. They lacked influence and authority for that reason, but also because many of them had left the region at a young age to go off and work in factories, some had gone off to school, some were law students who had gone off to Belgrade and Zagreb. So they were from villages, but they hadn't lived in those villages. So when they showed up, they were seen as foreigners, almost like anyone else. And most local fighters in this region, most of these insurgents, refused to collaborate with non-Serbs, those, those whom they perceived as non-Serbs. And of course, this was a key aspect of the communist program. The insurgents in this region were bound together by a need to fight for survival, Many of them had a powerful urge to take revenge on all those whom they perceived to be Croats. A few communists were categorically opposed to this revenge, but they were weak. And their weakness can be seen vividly in what happened during a number of the insurgents' first attacks in the region, which took place in late July and early August 1941. So one of the first villages they attacked was called Vrtoče. It happened to be the place where the leader of the Ustashes, Miroslav Matijevich, was born. He was in Kulinbakov, commanding the Ustashes, but in Vrtoče were other Catholics, including his parents, his mother and father. The first, things, the first thing that the insurgents did when they stormed into Vrtoče in early August was find his mother and father. They brought them out in front of the rest of the village. They cut off their heads. They placed their heads on top of sticks and then started walking around the village. Two, two men walked around the village holding these heads, while the rest chased every other Catholic they could find, killing them on the spot. This is a photograph of Josip Matijevich, Miroslav's father. This is the store and tavern that he ran uh, up until the summer of 1941. These are NDH soldiers who had re-entered this region later in the year, in, uh, in October of 1941. So you can see that they burned his business to the ground, Note that it seems as if they made an effort to literally erase his name from existence, just like they tried with every other Catholic resident of the village. With each one of these attacks, the insurgents' power grew more and more. More weapons after every attack, more numbers of people joining them. And so the, ins the insurgents, in the, ins the Ustashes, I should say, in Kulinbakov, realized by late August, early September, that they were outmanned and outgunned. And so they decided, we need to flee the region. Not just us, the Ustashas, we need to take the entire Catholic and especially Muslim population with us. And they, or they ordered uh, this population, most of whom were Muslim, about 5,600 people, to assemble at dawn on September 6, 1941, in Kulinvakov, to flee for the town of Bihat, which was about 50 kilometers away. They left that morning, climbing up a dirt switchback road in the mountains, 
And about two hours into this trip, the insurgents made contact with them. They were waiting in the forest, and they staged an ambush. <coughs> they quickly shot to death somewhere between three to 500 people who were in this column. And a major gun battle ensued. So the Ustashas were mostly at the head of the column. The insurgents were shooting. Part of the column managed to break through the ambush. And around 3,100 people, including most of the Ustashas, carried on toward Vikonj. The insurgents captured about 2,000 others on this road. They slowly, over the afternoon and the evening of September 6th, took them back down the switchback road, down to Kulinvakov. And it was there, during the next 48 hours, that they killed another 1,500 people. According to the sources, revenge, rather than belief in some kind of nationalist political ideology, was the central motivation driving those who carried out these killings. But what's interesting is that the killings did not begin immediately. So the population was brought back, this 2000, these 2,000 people were brought back to Kulinvakov. They were divided into several groups. Around 400 or so <coughs> children uh, taken to one location, another 1,000 taken to another, and about 450 or so men taken to another location, for men and boys. Several things happened on the evening of September 6th that set off the killing. First, that small number of communists, the 10 or 15 or so, who had managed to stop the killing on the road after the ambush went forward, after, the, after those who escaped the ambush and went on to Bihaj, the Ustashas, and the refugees, the communists were there and they were able to somehow stop the shooting on the road. They were back in Kulinbakov that night, and several of them decided to leave. They heard that other Ustashas were advancing from a nearby town. They were worried they were going to lose territory, and so they left. In my book, I call them the advocates of restraint. They left Kulinbakov. Several of the insurgents who were guarding the prisoners had heard that Orthodox Christians had been killed in Kulinbakov. They wanted to know where the mass graves were of these people. Several of the prisoners showed them. They ordered those prisoners to start digging up the bodies. They pulled these bodies out one by one by one. They had been freshly buried, and the insurgents gathered around and tried to determine if they knew any of these people, if they were their relatives or neighbors. More and more local Christian peasants, Orthodox Christian peasants, arrived who had heard Kulin Vakov had fallen. They were also interested in finding their loved ones who had been killed, and they also wanted to plunder the town. So imagine the atmosphere. The advocates of restraint leave. There's an exhumation in which the bodies are put on display of those people who are seeking revenge, related to those people who are seeking revenge. Plunder begins taking place. Those peasants arriving, as well as the insurgents, start breaking into the houses in Kulin Vakov. In some places, in taverns, they find alcohol. Some become drunk. Some start setting houses on fire. So, the atmosphere of the town burning. The mosque is set on fire, with the minaret going up in smoke. And all of these factors combine together to set off a frenzy of killing, which included, at first, most of the women and children, who were in a separate location. They were killed by drowning, thrown into the Una River. Most could not swim. They were beaten to death with sticks and even rocks. They were butchered with axes and farm tools. <clears throat> this is a view from one of the bridges over the Una River, slightly to the north of Kulinvakov, where the water goes through a small gorge, so it's a bit higher. On this bridge, several hundred women and children were trapped. They had tried to flee from one side, and on this side there were a group of peasants and insurgents holding axes and guns and knives, and on this side there was another group. So these women decided, instead of allowing their children and themselves to be cut to pieces, simply picked up their children and threw them over the bridge, where they drowned, and then threw themselves into the water, where most drowned, almost all. And yet, while this extreme violence was taking place, there were dramatic acts of rescue in the midst of this. By people, insurgents, Orthodox Serbs, who themselves had been rescued earlier in the summer by their Muslim and Catholic neighbors. So, this building, which is only about 200 meters away from that bridge, this is the old gendarmerie station, the police station in Kulinvakov. <clears throat> Several insurgents gathered together about 200 women and children, put them inside and off to the side of this building and around the back, and stood with their weapons cocked. And they refused to let any of the other insurgents come through who wanted to kill them and set the, set the building on fire. They managed to save several hundred women and children. 
it seems that during the 48 hours, about 500 lives were saved by small numbers of people intervening and refusing to step away and being willing to risk violence. Nonetheless, by the evening of September 7th, the next day, the entire town had been burned. This is what the town looked like. Um, you can see these are the remains of the bridge over the Una. You can't even see the minaret of the mosque anymore. And of course, every building had been torched. And the next day, the last group of prisoners who were still being held alive, about 400 to 420 men and boys, were marched 15 kilometers down a road to the south of Kulinbakov to a Serbian village called Martinbrod. That's the place where I showed you those spectacular waterfalls. Martinbrod is a natural wonder in paradise. Uh, on this day, it was something very different. Once they arrived, there were arguments among the insurgents, so again, an intra-ethnic conflict, about what to do with these prisoners. Some insisted, all of these men are Ustashas, kill them all. Others said, most of the people here have done nothing wrong. Those are our friends, those are our neighbors. There's maybe 10, 20 Ustashas. Kill those people and set the others free. There was a physical altercation between these two groups. They started fighting each other. In the end, the side in favor of killing prevailed. And they took the prisoners up a winding road to the site of a deep vertical cave known only to local residents. And at the edge of the cave, they cut the throats of each prisoner in groups of about 16. They dumped their bodies into the pit. One man at the last moment managed to get his hands free from the wire. He ran into the forest. He made it about 100 meters away and hid. He was not found. But he stayed there for the next several hours listening as each group of prisoners was brought as they were killed. That's the father of the woman whom, uh, whom I interviewed. So, during the 48 hours from September 6th through 8th, these Serb insurgents and peasants murdered about 2,000 of their Muslim neighbors. So this story is obviously terrifying and disturbing. But it's worth engaging with, I think, because of the analytical insights it offers about the more general dynamics of mass violence. And I'm going to finish here by returning to the two main research questions that I started with, offer a few brief comments about contributions, and I'll finish. So the first question was, what causes intercommunal violence among neighbors and multi-ethnic communities? In this story, when strong situa situational incentives emerged in the local community to decisively solve economic and interpersonal problems, some neighbors chose to engage in violence on an ethnic axis. This violence tended to occur in locations where, and at times when, perceived security threats of those neighbors targeted for persecution were the highest. And while this violence was certainly instituted and driven from above, it was also very much driven from below, especially in a context in which state control was weak and local autonomy over violence was strong. These findings provide us with ways of accounting for why, as well as when and where, neighbors and local communities who have been peaceful, if not entirely conflict-free for long periods, might attack their neighbors at certain moments. In doing so, we do not have to assume a sense of long-term conflict among so-called ethnic groups. And we don't have to accept notions of a group's traumatic history somehow mystically repeating itself. What is perhaps most striking in this story is the clear logic and rationality that drove some neighbors to attack each other on an ethnic axis. So the second question. How does violence affect identities and social relations in local multi-ethnic communities? <coughs> this violence propelled multiple, simultaneous transformations in the meaning of ethnic categories and boundaries in profound surges, and in so doing, the violence created new forms of local communities. This violence helped to create forces that sought to restrain killing, while creating new forms of power that sought to escalate killing. And taken together, the answers to both of these questions suggest a single overarching argument. Local intercommunal violence is not merely destructive in a host of ways. Rather, it can be an immensely generative force for the creation of social identities configurations of power. So those are the main findings that I hope people like yourselves in research universities will find useful in some way or another, if only to debate. But one last question, my last question that's worth considering is, what does a book like this have to offer people living in the shadow of this book?
people living today in Kulin Bog, in Bosnia, in Croatia. So the book has been translated. I just sent in the final version last night from a Starbucks, I think on Lane Street. <laughs> <laughs> it's full of students. Yeah. Hit send. Uh, it's right across the street from the CBS. <laughs> Here's what the cover looks like, or it's going to look like. So one could say that calling attention to this photograph that I took in 2014 <coughs> when I was finishing my research encapsulates what I see as the primary use of this book for people still living in the shadow of his history. So this was a monument built for a man whose name was Stojan Matic. He was an insurgent leader from a village about 25 kilometers away from Kulenbach, which called Neblusi, uh, a Serbian village. And he was one of those insurgents who would, I, I, I classified as an advocate of restraint. On the morning of September 6th, he had his gun out of his holster, shooting in the air, trying to get the insurgents to stop killing him. So after the war, a monument was built for him. And sometime in the 1990s, early 2000s, someone came along and from the other side fired bullets into his head. So these are the exit holes of the bullets. There's many more that are lodged in the side of his head. And this photograph vividly suggests how much the process of engaging with the past is a conscious choice. Those who want us to see Stoyan Matic today in a certain way have clearly stated their position by firing these bullets into his head. But other stories about the violent past exist. We just have to be willing to uncover them, to listen to them, and be willing to choose to tell them. So the history of the violent past is very much a choice. And in the same way, what we choose to imagine for the present and future, what people dare to allow themselves to dream about, these are also choices. And the capacity to imagine a different reality today and for tomorrow will be enhanced if one has the capacity to imagine a different past. Now, that may sound straightforward, maybe even easy. But in this part of Europe today, it is an enormous challenge, which is largely impossible for many people. The more recent violence of the 1990s has created a sense of historical consciousness in which historical <coughs> contingency the capacity to see a past in which people make choices seem to be erased, silenced, even destroyed. And instead, the phrase that one hears most frequently from taxicab drivers in cities like Belgrade, Sarajevo, or Zagreb is often what passes in the region for historical explanation. So, if we took a plane tomorrow to Belgrade, we got in a taxi cab and I explained in Serbian to the driver that I'm actually a historian of the Balkans, I'm interested in violence. It probably wouldn't be too long before he would say to me something like this. Brate, kod nas, historia se puna. Which means, brother, here, history repeats itself. But history in this part of the Balkans, just like history anywhere in the world, does not mystically repeat itself. People make history. And they do so by making choices. So at the most general level, my book is about the need to more closely examine human choice, both in the making of history and in the telling of history. And my hope is that one day, people in this part of Europe, one day, perhaps very soon, next week maybe, people in this part of Europe might pick up this book, read this story, and perhaps the way I've chosen to tell it might help, it up, help open up new vistas for imagining not just different paths, but also different futures. And in my telling of this history, identity, nationalism, and memory are often not what <coughs> caused violence to wreck the lives of so many. Instead, far fewer people chose to perpetrate violence. And in so doing, they created and recreated highly antagonistic forms of identity, nationalism, and memory. And today they loom large in many people's lives in this part of the world, and they make an ethnically divided present and future seem almost unavoidable. A lack of comprehension of how this fractured sense of historical consciousness comes to be places huge limits on the possibilities for change in the present and future. And to move forward with a greater sense of possibility will require first looking back and reconsidering how we tell the story of the violent past. And it will require a new story that includes a much more heightened sense of the role of human choice 
and the making and telling of history. Thanks.